guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It's been a really nice week, minus my trip to the dentist. Oh, yeah. Oh, I had to go to the dentist this week. <laughs> so I can't remember which video it was, but like my jaw hurt so bad. I could only open it like... Just a tiny so, little bit. And I, I don't know. Well, you had to have them numb you up quite a bit, right? Yeah, a lot. Four like... times. <laughs> Four extra times. Because <laughs> my teeth are so sensitive. Anyway, uh, so that, that happened one of the days. <laughs> Uh, but we've had a lot of rain and we're starting to see a little bit of color out in the garden like the scillas are starting to bloom the ones we planted underneath that big spruce in the entryway and we planted those in January on a nice day in January and then we're also seeing I just noticed last night it stopped me in my tracks uh, the iris reticulata on mm -hmm. the west side of the house underneath the juniper I planted a bunch there and I, I kind of want to wait to take a picture of it because they're just starting to open and I'd love to see it look a little bit more thick mm -hmm. with color but that's always fun. It's just, it's weird that we're nearing April and our daffodils, yeah. like we have no normal blooms for this time of year. Like the cold and the moisture, it's just very atypical and very good. For I hope our that area. it holds on. I mean, I, I hope the, the cool, like, like last year. Yes. Because I remember doing a garden tour in June and you had a sweatshirt on and yeah. we're comfortable. Yes. And that's pretty nice mm -hmm. for, for us because a lot of times in june it can get pretty darn really? hot some years it's like 100 plus yeah like beginning of june but last year yeah and it stayed green for a lot longer mm -hmm. last spring we were actually talking about with all the rain we've been getting like how quickly if we got rain like we did this week a little mm -hmm. bit at night and in the morning and then sunshine in the afternoon how quickly would our landscape change if that was consistent? Yeah, not necessarily our like immediate landscape, or but our, the, our areas, the landscape. area around yeah. us. Yeah, like because um, we have like no trees grow unless it's right next to like a river bank unless or something it's like that. A juniper or elm, trash elms grow grow around here. But I feel like even those, like someone had to plant them. They might survive once they're established, probably. But they yeah. don't grow naturally, like you know, like Their in other areas. Their roots go for days. Yeah. They. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see what would happen with our landscape if we started getting rain Things on a consistent basis. Things that are invasive basis. in other areas might Yeah, we don't deal be, with that ever. It's, yeah. it, it's not awkward, but, like, I just have no point of reference when people talk about, like, like invasive the species. the Lily of the Valley. So, so one of you guys gave me Lily of the Valley starts when we were in the, at the Seattle show, the flower show, and I was so excited about it, and it, a lot of you guys were like, who would give Lily of the Valley yeah. as a gift? Uh, it, they're so invasive. They're just, like, I've been battling them in my garden. That is not the way it is here. Uh, same with Virginia Creeper. Mm -hmm. There's just, and Budlia, and Barberries, all those kinds of things that we can plant here that that thrive and do really well they just don't spread right They're, we don't have the environment for it right anyway that leads me to our first video from this week which was a rainy day plant shopping day and aaron had a mission to get some north pole arborvitas we knew that my parents had just got a load in that had some big b and b ones so that they would kind of match our hedge i'm surprised they found them that big it's, i know it's oftentimes hard to find plants like that yeah. in you know in a big bald and burlap yeah um, so I picked up a few small little evergreens and kind of gave you a look around the nursery and I was maybe going to go out and plant a few of those things today that I picked up, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, SD can 574 said, you mentioned gophers taking out your crab apple tree. This is in the old house when they did that. We have a terrible gopher and mole problem. Any suggestion on how to get rid of them? You know, when we, when we actually moved into this house, we had a tremendous gopher population. It mm -hmm. was just huge because... Uh, they were just starting to develop the land just near us for the subdivision, which we knew was going to happen. But when that development starts, it pushes all of the like wildlife over mm -hmm. toward our garden uh, because there's not any there at that point. There was no activity like that. And so all of a sudden we just had this huge boom and gopher activity. And they took out like they took out the forsythias in the front. It was always that front flower bed that's yeah. no longer there. Well, it's there. It's just different shape now. Uh, they took out my Centara double blue lilac. They took out roses. They, um, they took out a lot of things, even mm. just in this garden. And we ended up getting rid of them with traps. In fact, we didn't even do it. Our neighbor did it. He would come over on his four wheel, and I think he enjoyed it too. Like he would, he would go, "Hey, Laura, I got another one," yeah. <laughs> and you know, from across the property. And he would just check his trap line twice a day, yeah. and would he took care of it. And I think too, when we started to uh, develop the South Garden area, it probably pushed him 
to more into other people's yeah i don't know i don't know we still have a little bit of gopher activity but not like we did before but well, we there just is use traps. on the new property the new new property that we bought yeah I, there's a bunch of mounds over yeah. there too so we probably just pushed them all over there yeah. which is fine they can they can they hang can out have there for a while for now <laughs> heidi said what is the plant at 1509 that had a lemon cypress vibe uh that is a frankie boy arborvita it's a thuria occidentalis and I'm trying to remember, it's probably like a zone five through eight, maybe five through nine, probably five through eight. But they grow like four to six feet tall and upwards of like three feet wide. So they're not a huge arb, but they do have kind of that wild hair kind of appearance, but they have that yellow coloring, which is really fun. Uh, Pamela said, would gypsum help the hard pan soil around those arbs and release nu nutrients? Yes. The thing about gypsum though, is it's like kind of a quick in and out and you have to be consistent. consistent. It's not something you can stop doing either. I did it at our last house in the townhouse garden because when we moved in, it was actually, our house was in a kind of a draw that my dad used to hunt in when he was a little kid. Um, and it was like swamp down yeah. there. And you could tell because we would uh, dig holes and it would, the soil was gray and like anaerobic and like smelled like swampy. It was was gross. it wet because they were irrigating and the water would just flow down, down to down that there. point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was just... It was kind of gross. There was no earthworms. And I started in with um, soil activator and humates and gypsum. And I did that consistently. And by the end, by the time we were moving out, it was more crumbly and more like kind of like chocolate cake. And there were earthworms in it. And I felt so proud of myself mm -hmm. for doing that. So what we did is we would always get, I, tr I tried to spread, spread powdered gypsum one time on the yard because it's cheaper. And uh, it was a total mess. I put it in my broadcast spreader. And I ended up just taking handfuls and just trying to... Gypsum isn't all that expensive, though. No, it's not. When you get it pelleted, it's a little bit more. But I thought, well, like, it's half the cost to get it as a powder form. So I may as well try that. It'll right. probably stretch further. Powdered form is great if you're going to dump it on the soil and work it in. Or, like, put it at the bottom of a planting hole. But pelleted is so much cleaner. And mm -hmm. so it's because the powder stuff is like flour. Yeah. It just gets everywhere. Um, so I did the... Yeah, I did the gypsum. Every time I planted something new, it was at the bottom of the hole. And then um, we would spread it like three, four times a year on the grass. And it just helped so much. So that is something. Did you put gypsum in? I know you do sulfur. And this is kind of Aaron's baby, the barbs are. I have, I have put gypsum over there. I've been more consistent with gypsum on the lawn mm. um, and, and in the south garden too. So I drive the lawn tractor. I put it in the back of that big spreader. Mm -hmm. And it's got like a 20-foot or more spread uh -huh. um, and in the south garden I drive right up on the edge of the grass so that it's shooting out into the flower beds too uh -huh. uh, and I do that multiple times a year uh -huh. so that area is getting it more consistently the arbs aren't getting it it's uh, weird though because all the arbs are doing so well just like, like we showed in the video yeah they're all doing really well it's just a couple problem arbs so I don't really know what the one for sure there was I don't know how many you've planted in that one That's hole. The, this is the fourth one that we've planted Poor thing. <laughs> and, but it's been awesome because we've been getting enough rain. I haven't watered it at all. No. Just letting the, you know, spring rains. Also, Aaron put down a uh, chelated iron around all of our hydrangeas and all of our maples. And he was so proud of himself because it rained really good. Like a really, really good drenching rain right after. So you talked about that all week. <laughs> he was like, sure glad I put that iron down. <laughs> you know what? When you time it right, yeah. just feel good about yourself. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yep. And things are starting to wake up a little bit. So they're starting to actively, like the roots are actively taking it up. We've never put chelated iron down this early, but we figured as a preventative, like maybe that would be helpful gonna, to get ahead of the problem. I'm going to do it once a month. Are you? Yeah. Which it like seems excessive and for our size of garden is ex it's expensive too because mm -hmm. those bags i know they're expensive were they like 60 70 90 90 dollars mm -hmm. yeah um it's like if you're, you're looking at it per plant cost like if you break it down to that it doesn't seem like that much it's just that we have so many plants that need to be treated yeah for a regular garden like a regular say town lot uh -huh. you could buy one of those big bags and it would last you for years yeah because it's like half a teaspoon but not if per you plant plant rows of trees well it's maples maples yeah, tend right. to and we haven't really seen a problem with the autumn blaze have you well what i noticed is that all the new autumn blaze that we planted um Last along year. the on the what is it the west side of the yeah the lawn they had this like gorgeous red color 
And then the other ones that were more established were kind of more yellowy, and yeah. they didn't and like burned last yeah, year. Yeah, they were they were kind of burned. Yeah. So and you, a lot of times the burning is because they're not they're not enough iron to stay that like deep green mm -hmm. you know leaf color. So what I'm trying to do is get lots of iron on the established ones mm -hmm. to try to get that like orangey red you know fall color. And I think over time, with all the compost we're putting down, I mean, that's what we use as a mulch, um, all of the amendments that we're putting down, I think we'll be able to get ahead of, of problems. It's, yeah. it's never going to be a 100% fix because even our water is high pH. Like, everything is high pH here, mm -hmm. which things struggle with. Um, but I think if we're consistent, it'll be less and less of a, a struggle. Sure. I think. Uh, Jay Harrison said, have you had the soil tested down at the root level in that area of the ARBs? Oh, not that specific area. We've had yeah. it tested. We did the, the my soil samples. Yeah, and another one. What was the other company? I can't remember. Yeah. That feels like it was so long ago. It was years ago. ago it was like three it was years before ago. we developed. Yeah, it was like three or four years ago. Was it before the flower garden was in the middle of the lawn area? Or was the flower garden already out there? I think you... Yeah, I think it was before the flower garden. Wow. DH said, so we just had 100 arbs delivered and planted at our house today. Dang. They were planted with burlap and string. Well, it depends on what kind of string. I mean... Well, okay. Uh, still on the root ball. Apparently, both are biodegradable and should be gone in a couple of years. Never heard of that before. What do you think about that? It could be a biodegradable sp string. Is there a biodegradable string? Well, yeah. If it's twine, then no. No. But, you know, yeah, there could there could be... I've never seen a b, &B. I would still take the string I off. I would take the string. As much of the string as you can get off. I think the most important thing... I wouldn't worry about the burlap at all. That'll, that will disintegrate and fall apart. And roots will just punch right through that. Um, but I would make sure that that string is not tied around the trunk of the arbs because that will be the death of your trees eventually um, if that's left on there. So I'd get in there, cut that off if possible, and you should be okay. Because even the string, like the roots will, yeah, as long it just, as it's cut. Yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of people too, like even in this area, you can get those trees with the big metal baskets and they say, just leave the baskets on because they, you know, rust out, whatever. You remember that great big blue spruce tree that we had fall over in our front yard in the Versailles garden? That still had, I don't know how old that tree was. It had to have been 20, yeah. 30 years. That right. metal basket was still intact underneath that tree. And yeah. I, I don't know. I think you can lower your tree into the hole with the basket on because the whole goal is to not break the root ball because that'll be the death of your tree too. So I understand why people leave the stuff on the root ball as they're putting in the hole. Then you got to get down in there and make as many cuts as possible and remove as much of the stuff as you can just to give your trees a, a head start. And it could be different in different areas. Those metal baskets may rust out in areas that are high moisture. But in our area, I mean, they don't rust out. They just stay there. But, you know, we're pretty high moisture around the root balls of those trees because they have to be watered. Well, that one wasn't. That one... It didn't rust out, no. No. Like, it was still shiny. Yeah. And there was still a little bit of twine. Right. Yeah. I would... I feel yeah. so sad for that tree. I mean, I think, I think what you should try to do, if, if you can, is, yeah, stick it in the hole. Have a big enough hole to where you can, like, pull the basket apart and uh -huh. then just cut as much as you can out yeah. if you leave if some at the bottom in there yeah you know but if if it's kind of still wrapping i feel like that's a bad move yeah you should get the rest of it out and i i think maybe we'll have differing opinions on that based on climate and you know how things do i yeah. guess in your particular soil and moisture level but uh, Ram said, okay, be honest, does Aaron really like doing gardening projects or would he prefer to just deal with the grass and leave all the other stuff to Laura? He looks like he doesn't really seem to enjoy it as much as Laura does. I do not enjoy the work aspect of, of gardening. Mm -hmm. I, I like the, I like the mowing the lawn. Yeah. Um, but you yeah. seem to be okay with the amendments and all of that stuff. Yeah, I, I don't hate mind the part. amendments. And I, I guess like the planting part doesn't bother me as much. But I'm not a huge fan of like the pruning and the like caring for, sure. you know, for plants. Mm -hmm. That doesn't strike that doesn't my thrill fancy. you. No, not really. I think it's a pretty good blend though, because the things that you like to do, I don't necessarily like to do, mm -hmm. or I'm not, I don't stay on top of. And maybe the things that I like to do, you don't like to do. Yeah. So yeah. It, it works out pretty good. Yeah. You hate spreading amendments. I do. I just, I'll do it when I when I plant the plant, and then I'm like, you're on your own, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, if it gets, if you get amendments, then you can thank Aaron for it <laughs> later on. Uh, Chelsea Mac said, if your growing zone is six, 
and you plant something from a zone two, would it suffer in the summer heat the zone six get? Not, not necessarily. The zones that you see listed on a plant tag tell you how cold that plant can handle. Sometimes they'll have a heat index range too, mm-hmm. which I don't know as much about, but like you'll see a heat index of seven or whatever. And I don't even know what that means. Um, so if you're in a six and you plant something that's hardy to zone two, then you're probably good to go. Um, I'm on the edge of zone nine through 10. It would love to grow some spruce in my garden. Now that I don't know about. I don't know. I guess the question is, does anyone else have spruce in your yeah, area? Yeah, that's and a good... And if they do, then go ask them how they did it. That's a great indicator. Yeah. What are other people growing in your area? There may be some spruces that go up to a zone nine, and in which case, give it a try. But typically, they like a little bit of a cooler climate. Shelly McGeever said, in a prior video, you showed the spraying of your fruit trees for leaf curl. Now that you have received two new nectarine trees that are already beginning to show signs of budding, do you still spray them for leaf curl? Yes. Yeah, we'll still need to spray those for leaf curl. Thank you for the reminder. (laughs) Uh, They come from a grower, which I'm assuming that they do a spray regimen, you know, so they probably are okay, but I'm just assuming that they would be. So I think giving them a spray now would be a smart thing to do. All right, next video is spring containers full of color. Is that the window boxes? I've done a couple of containers. That was the window box and the two containers up at the front door. On the front porch, yes. And it was funny because I was planning out doing that project that morning and it was pretty nice and still. Yeah. And then I got out there. It got windy and it was like really frigid feeling. And I thought, oh, well, this is dumb. But you were still wearing sandals. I was. My my feet are impervious to weather, (laughs) just so you all know. I'm not out there suffering. Yeah, as long as I keep my core warm. So I had like my big puffy vest on that day and I was super warm. I was really comfortable. Sharon said, I have to ask what happens when you water these and the ones you just did on the back porch window boxes? Uh, Don't they drip and make a big mess on your porch? Yep, they do. Uh, The ones on the wood porch, I did grab a couple of clear plastic square saucers that fit perfectly under the urns. So we're just very careful about how much water we give those. We've had them run over occasionally and we just have to take a towel out because that is wood. The rest of them, the window boxes, they don't make a mess on the house because they sit out from the house just enough. uh, But they do drip onto the patio, which is something I really don't like. But I don't know how to get away from that. I mean, there's really nothing. Unless you could have like a drip pan Pan, of some kind and then with a tube that like runs away to a flower bed what a pain though yeah yeah i don't know if we ever put a porch we've you know thought about putting a porch around the house like building up kind of a deck porch thing uh we'll probably eliminate window boxes because we won't want that Mm -hmm. kind of mess paul power washed all the sidewalks and painted them again they had been painted prior to us moving in so they were looking pretty rough we'd never done it around the whole base of the house they looked so much better i almost feel bad like seeing the water go down on the sidewalks sorry paul Robin said, will the alyssum bloom well there if left through the summer? I'm assuming that it's a part shade, part sun location. Uh, on the front porch, yes. I think the alyssum would do fantastic through the summer months, and it's something I might leave in those pots. But given heat, those in that series, the it's uh, like Blushing Prin- Princess, White Knight, Violet Knight, they get massive, mm-hmm. massive. Like one plant will be like so big. Um, So it's probably not a location I'd want to keep it size-wise, but I I think it would do well. They are a full sun-loving plant, though, so I think given full sun, they get that big. It might Mm -hmm. stay a little bit smaller because that spot is shaded for some of the day. Paulette said, I'm wondering how Laura will cover those tall, wispy hookah blooms in the window box with cloths to protect them from freezing. I don't cover the blooms. I just cover the base of the plant. So far, everything's doing really well. I covered them up last night because it was supposed to get to 30, but I do see a 25, a 27, a 29 on the forecast. I swear, we're just like cruising with just spring i mean we yeah. can't like get above that freezing mark one of the nights is 38 i think oh but then it good. goes down to 27 the next night which means wind we'll mm. have a windy day i'm sure jaylene said the front doorway urns potted up beautifully are the urns from unique stone you know they are not i picked those up at la junk in boise when my mom and i were out and about one day they had a pair of beautiful iron urns yeah and i don't know what brand or or what, but I do love the shape and the size of them. Carrie said, I noticed that the kitchen window box was in the shade. Does it ever get sun for a tiny amount of time in the morning in the summer? Uh, When the sun is all the way up in the sky, it gets just a little bit in the morning. Like 20 minutes. Like, yeah, like 20, 30 minutes Mm -hmm, and then it's done. Anthony said, can you make a video showing what you do with these flowers when you're ready to switch for summer containers? For instance, where will you plant the hookahs and do you toss the annuals? Uh, everything kind of just depends. Did I do? I did that this last year. 
didn't I? Yeah, I, I think you made a video about that. Yeah. And, um, if it fits in with our, our process, I will definitely show you guys that. Um, but like the hookahs, I'll just find a spot because I've got five of them in that window box. I'll find a spot where I can put all five of those hookahs and we'll pop them in the ground. If we don't decide to keep them in there, they might look great and they would love that location through the whole season. Um, that's the thing about hookahs. They're kind of like hostas or I don't know. They just kind of like maintain yeah. the same look. I mean, they bloom stalks right now, which will need to be deadheaded eventually. But um, and then the annuals, it kind of just depends. Like the primrose, I will toss. They never hold well through a summer, and they don't come back for us uh, very nicely. Uh, the pansies will probably toss. Violas, I will sometimes replant because they do, they're perennial, and they'll come back. But everything kind of just depends on how they look at the moment. If they look exceptional and I don't have a place in my garden, I usually put it out to friends and say, like, hey, I've got these buckets full of pansies. If anybody wants to try them in a shady location for summer, here they are. Uh, Tony said, did I miss the video where you guys got new chairs on the side porch? No, I haven't bought new chairs in a long time. Are they talking about the ones that are covered? Oh, by the kitchen window box? Yeah. Probably. Maybe. Because we haven't, we still Those haven't. are the only new, that's true. I'm I not did even sure I've seen them yet because I think they still have the plastic on. Yeah. I haven't yeah. seen them either. They arrived when it, there was snow on the ground and Paul took them out of the box, put the covers on and there they sit. Yeah. They arrived. They kept pushing the ship date. Like. I think they pushed it out eventually like three months. Um, so well, we, you're even talking about moving those from there yeah, to the, to the new patio. patio area and getting a bistro because we did use that table, that concrete table, which I will find a spot for. I love that table. Maybe that one will we'll come go back. back. Uh, but I, I think with that area being so close to the kitchen, it's shaded almost all the time. We would be able to use it to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll have the bigger table under the ash tree up front for like larger when more people are here. Um, but it's, it is a little bit more of a walk to that one. And then um, we'll have the smaller one for just us, you know, when mm -hmm. we're home and want to eat outside. Irma said, if it's so cold and windy, how are you wearing sandals? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we've, we've just discussed that because the moment I can, I will. Next video was filling up the cold frames in the Hartley with ranunculus, and that was super satisfying to do. One, because we started growing the ranunculus ourselves, uh, and I ended up, so I thought I could fit 100 on either side. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> uh, or 200, rather. Yeah. Uh, so 100 on each side. I ended up with just over 50 per side, <laughs> which worked out perfectly because I'd used the marshmallow, violet, and yellow ranunculus, and I tried to disperse the colors evenly so it'll look like just a really pretty bouquet coming out of each one of those cold frames and then the 80 some that were left uh, are white they're white with a question mark so oh. when they were stored they were put in a bag that says white question mark <laughs> and one of them looks like it's starting to gonna open up and bloom and it might be red oh no <laughs> i don't know so we may have a mix there but i will use those out somewhere else but we were refreshed the soil in there we had raised bed mix that we put in there last spring and we put in a bunch of land and sea compost and i ran drip which was really nice to have that set up even though it's not running yet it's there so we can hook it up is ranunculus a cool season annual yeah uh, or yes. does it go all no it's cool season okay. it kind of it acts just like bulbs it comes up and blooms and then you wait till the foliage yellows and dies back and then you uh cut it back and i'm just realizing i'm saying two words that i'll probably i'll get corrected for ranunculus ranunculus yeah somebody typed that in and it's and i say ranunculus and then uh, foliage. 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 Anyway, <laughs> I don't Ren know. Um, I it's not that. spelled ranunculus. It is. With a D? Ranunculus. Ranunculus. I say oh. ranunculus. I'd leave the Ren N out that's in the middle. I'm sorry. Wait a second. I'm confused now. Ranunculus. Renun. R A N U N. Culus. Ren. Have I been just misspelling it? Probably have. We spell it how we say it <laughs> yeah. around here. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mary said, what size are the cement planters beside the Harley? Oh, boy. Those are the Jumbo Garland Jardiniers. Jardiniers. That's how they told me to pronounce it. Yeah. It's not, is that right? Does that just feel wrong every time you wrong. say it? It feels wrong. It feels like it needs to have a French pronunciation. Yeah. Anyway, so, oh, there's an extra large, extra, extra large, and extra, extra, extra large. Jeez, it's okay. So There's I no think Jumbo? They're all jumbos. Oh. <laughs> Medium jumbo, large jumbo, extra large jumbo, which is what I think we have. It's the 25 inches high by 31 inch diameter. Jumbo is kind of a funny word. Jumbo. If you think about it, just keep saying it over and over. It jumbo, doesn't make any jumbo, sense. Jumbo, jumbo, jumbo. Jumbo. <laughs> 
Isn't that a funny word? A little bit, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, Cheryl, said, what's a cold frame? California girl here. Okay, so cold frames are used differently than I'm using ours. I'm using ours as like a raised bed, essentially. Typically use a cold frame to protect... Um, crops like if you've started crops in a greenhouse and you've got them in trays and things and you want to harden them off and get them ready to put outside in a colder climate area because it's so much warmer in a greenhouse you need an interim spot to put those um, and cold frames really kind of serve as that and they've got you know windows or the doors that you can open uh, which will allow more uh, air in during the day and you can gradually open them more and more and then just leave them open until you know your plants are ready to go outside because they're more acclimated to the weather outside so a lot of people will use them that way. A lot of people will set up a cold frame. I've seen them where you can just pop them on the ground and grow greens in the wintertime. And you just use them as almost like a cloach. You know, as you're saying that, Hartley should offer um, cold frames that open with that heat activated. Yes. What's it called? The, um, the Bayless... Uh, something or other uh-huh we have i mean it's in the it's in the we greenhouse have them for the vents at the top yeah of the that's greenhouse. what they should have for the cold yes. frames because then when it gets hot it opens yeah it cools down they close again we should have that i don't know if it's a weight thing those those uh lids you know what, are though? pretty heavy those bayless entry things whatever they're called they are stout like are they, they can they can hold a lot of weight could you retrofit i think you could I don't, I don't see why not. The only thing is that it might have to open it from the front. So you would have, you would like see it in the middle, you know, so it would like block your Mm -hmm. entry to the, I don't know if you could, it would also have to open it a long way too. Yeah. That would sure be nice though. I mean, it's okay. It's fine going out and opening and closing. I'm like right now I'm thinking, well, it's kind of windy-ish. Maybe I'll open them later this afternoon. Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe not. You kind of have to be mindful of the weather. And if it gets, if it warms up and you're busy doing something or not here, those plants could fry. Right. You know, they could get way too hot in there. Uh, So you have to do, you do have to be mindful. It stays warm in our greenhouses. Oh my goodness. Even on a cold winter day, if that sun is out, Mm -hmm. they heat up. It's amazing. Uh, Going Green Mom said, how does self-cleaning glass work? I'm not sure. I mentioned in that video that we passed on the self-cleaning glass for two reasons. One, it was expensive. It was expensive. Two, it has a tint when the sun hits it. It's got kind of a bluish tint to it. And I really just wanted that clear glass look. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how it works. Do you know anything about it? I mean, I'm guessing it's like a Rain-X kind of a thing where it's got it's like, built like a film, you know, that's on it that uh-huh. just wicks the water away. And so like dust and, and water and stuff. Well, and that's the other thing is that I think you need rain for it to kind of self-clean. Oh, sure. Um, and I don't know if, like, if we want to be watering, you know, the if we, house. like, ran a hose on yeah. it. And I feel like we have so many minerals in our water, mm-hmm. uh, hard water, mm-hmm. that it would just, we'd end up having sure. white deposits all so over. So I don't really know. Worth it, yeah, I don't know how it works. It. That's why we were, we were kind of trepidatious about, like, it's not worth spending the money on something that's sort of untested. Like, I don't yeah. know any, or anybody around here that has self-cleaning glass. Right. Um, so yeah, well, I was just showing you how clean our glass is, and we haven't had it cleaned for months now. Yeah. In fact, usually, like I'll have the house windows cleaned four times a year, once every season. Typically, is kind of my schedule, and um, we had the house windows were being cleaned, and we just skipped the greenhouse. I'm like I don't think it really needs it right now. Maybe after we get done with the brick patio area, yeah, when we're kicking up a lot more dust and stuff, dirt in the air, we'll need it. But I'm really, really happy with it. Uh, Laura said your ranunculus is exactly what my ranunculus look like every spring right before it damps off. Dang it. What could I be doing wrong? Crowding, overwatering, wrong temperature. Please help me. Um, it, most of the time it's a over, it's a water issue. I would, I would think with ranunculus, I haven't had a whole lot of issue with them. It could be like humidity and too hot where you have them. It could be too, I don't know. You got to start eliminating, like go through the list and say, you know, Am I overwatering? No, I think the soil's drying out between time. I know my soil and mine is drying out because they wilt. I'm like, get me a hose and they need some water and maybe that's why mine do so well. Like I make them suffer and yeah. build up immunity to you you know, certain things. But you know, all of those things that you listed could play into something like that. Um, so I would start eliminating things, trying to fix those things one at a time and see if it helps you. Yeah, that's a, that's a bummer. 
Elsie GSD mom said, everyone looks to be enjoying that sunshine, bringing up the issue, dirt settling in beds. I have a really deep bed that I planted, fall gold raspberries. I found that two seasons later, the dirt has dropped about a foot. Is there anything, oh, foot, my goodness. Is wow. there anything I can do? Or do I just need to let it exist the way it is? I think in a raspberry bed, you could start adding soil. Those raspberries won't care. They'll still grow. Yeah. I would just start adding, not probably a foot of soil, but I'd add some, add a few inches until you get it back up to soil level and those raspberries will just probably keep on trucking. Monique said, will you need to eventually replace the soil in the cold frames like you do with regular pots? Or will you just need to continue to top it up with more soil or compost? We're just gonna continue to top it up with more soil and compost. We did put a big layer of like firewood, but it's tight down there. Like we've, we've stacked had, it really. We've had really good luck with adding compost to old soil. Yeah. Like if you've got really crummy that you, it's either too difficult or would be too hard to, to clean to out, clean out mm -hmm. all the way, like just throw compost. I mean, I don't think it would be smart to fill up an entire bed with just compost mm -hmm. yeah, it could to plant be in too it. Much. Yeah. yeah, but for recharging it, it mm -hmm. seems to work. Kathy said, is the land and sea compost the same compost that you use in bulk in the big beds out in the, I wish. Uh, big beds out in the spacious parts of your gardens. I wish we could get it in bulk, but I can't even imagine what it would cost bulk. It come no, it's not. It comes yeah. from the other side of Oregon. Um, the the compost we do use, we use in our flower beds, the, yeah. yeah. And that I think that has um, some acidity to it. So just it's because been really the other side of the it's state. been working really well. It's pretty too. Like mm -hmm. it's not only good for our soil, but it maintains its deep brown instead of graying out like mm -hmm. a lot of other mulches and composts do, uh, which makes things look extra dry in a dry climate. Um, anyway, they yeah, the land and sea though, everywhere we put that, I swear things just like, oh, it's, a, it's good stuff. Tracy said, how was it on your back leaning into those cold frames? Not bad at all. I was um, on one of the bags of land and sea. I had like half a bag left mm -hmm. and I just put it in front of the cold frame and had my knees on it and just reached in and did my thing. I don't know. Do you know. need to put like a kneeling pad on the brick no nope. as you're leaning forward well i had big puffy coat or vest oh, on that helps there you go yeah so maybe like in the summertime if i'm just wearing like this maybe the bricks would like cut in i don't know but no it wasn't uncomfortable at all in fact um what was i doing the other day oh trimming hydrangeas that action like being like this is way more uncomfortable mm. than being on my knees in front of those cold frames. Next video is edging the grass and plans for the center of the cut flower garden is something that Aaron and I needed to get out there and decide some things that kind of get an idea for that space, how we wanted to move forward with it, because this year I think we'll get the grass all honed in. Um, we'll get the sprinklers moved, how they need to be moved and everything will be a little bit more straight and mm -hmm. tidy instead of, you know, I had flowers flopping over the grass last year, blocking water flow. And because I didn't actually think we'd get to the grass last year, Anyway, so we need to move things in. I'll have a little bit less space to plant things because I need to leave more space for the, the mm -hmm. grass edge. Anyway, V. Nick, Nick Colvin said, what about low water? Uh, a low water pool in the circle the kids could walk in. We've thought about like something either pool-ish in the center. I don't think I want to do a massive fountain. Um, I, I don't want anything to block our view of the flower shed. I think that it needs to be in scale with the watershed, which might, or flower shed, which might mean that we do some plantings around the outer part and then do a, a smaller fountain in the center, not a 12 foot basin. Um, or we do a 12 foot basin and just have like a little spray of water and have the, the basin be acidable. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you can use it as seating almost. Um, or we do something in ground so it's lower than the flower shed, which would be really cool. I think I would really like that. Um, and that way you could see the shed back there. You just want to do everything in proportion mm -hmm. you know what i mean I mean also something lower would be better for wind we do have a lot of wind out there if sure. we have a tiered fountain i mean you see the water blowing out of that one in the front we, we turn it we off turn it off yeah we yeah, turn it off windy. but you see how it, that could happen yeah anyway yeah i do like that idea charlene said would some drone footage help confirm your lines and placement I don't really know why I didn't get the drone out. I think I, I think intended I to. You, I asked you, you said, how am I going to do measurements and fly the drone at the same time? I said, well... You're still mad about our I, conversation <laughs> earlier. <laughs> but but uh, that was a suggestion that I made to Aaron during our conversation during this project. And, and you didn't want to do it. I said that I can edge grass while you fly the drone. You should have taken me up on it because edging grass is no fun. I don't mind it. 
Really? No, it's not hard at all. Oh, geez, those pieces are so heavy. It's very mm. tangible, and it's, I'm like satisfied in the end and yeah. glad I did it, but it's not, not a super fun process. Yeah. Anyway, you could have been flying the drone during that, Aaron. Totally could have been. I don't know that you would actually see. Could you see the lines very well? I don't know. Well, I should get the drone out there and just see what it looks yeah. like now. Yeah, you should. Uh, Cynthia said, this will be beautiful. Have you considered a bench without a back? That way you could face the gardens or the fountain. I didn't really think about that. I always think hmm. of the back as kind of creating our boundary. Yeah. Like it's kind of creating the room or helping create the room. If we put a, a small tree behind the bench, it probably wouldn't work to do a backless bench because then you'd be swinging around and like looking at the trunk of a tree. Backless benches also just aren't as comfortable. I guess, but I mean, are you going to be out there lounging? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Uh, Denton said, it's going to look so good. Are you planning on adding any type of lighting in this area? We need to. Lighting needs to be a thing. Yeah. Up here. You know, I contacted two companies last fall, um, late summer, mm -hmm. and they both sounded like, yeah, let's do this. And I was like, cool. Well, one of you will work out. Mm -hmm. And neither one. Shoot. I mean, I, they're both I in the Boise them. area, right? No. No. Um, I, well, it was like the marketing people of these. Because oh, sure. oftentimes, like, I can't get a hold of anybody in Boise, or I couldn't at least last year. Uh -huh. Nobody would return, return my call from uh -huh. Boise. Um, so I thought, well, maybe if I talk to a marketing person at one of these companies, then maybe one of them, you know, they would like send somebody over. Cause it's like, we'll pay, but maybe like, let's do a video out of it or uh -huh. something, you know, sure. but just to get somebody out here. Um, but anyway, so far, no dice. Uh, Pat said, what did you and Aaron major in at university? Horticulture? You're uh, so knowledgeable. Neither of us, uh, we both got uh, an associates. Yeah, we both got an associates, but and that's it. That's it. Yeah, I grew up in the horticulture industry. My parents have a garden center here in town, and uh, they have fully developed, mature gardens that are beautiful. Uh, I've showed you in tours before, but that's the garden I grew up in, and helped in, and learned in, and all that business. So, um, anyway, yeah, and I worked full time at the garden center for like ten years yeah. or so, um, and I worked there as a child too, like helping out and, and that sort of thing. Um, never thought I would end up there full time, but I did and I loved it. Uh, yeah. And you've learned a lot. I mean, you can't help but learn a lot when you're, I mean, Aaron was our primary editor for a while, yeah. like many years. And so you're not only filming the project at that point, you don't film as many of them now, but um, you were filming them and then you were editing them. So you were hearing all that information multiple times right. and a lot of it has sunk in. I still feel like an editor though. I'm not doing near as much editing, uh -huh. um, but like I'll edit this video uh -huh. um, that we're doing right now. And we got off schedule this week. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, I had to edit on the weekend. What was I going to say? Oh, and then like going through all the videos, like I upload all the videos in the evenings mm -hmm. and I make that last pass. And like the video that went out this morning, I we didn't give the right footage to Ken, so. Yeah, that's why we. Ken has a hard time editing footage that we don't give yeah, him. Yeah, sorry about that, Ken. <laughs> that's kind of like a bricks without straw situation. Yeah. yeah, so we got the card and then we forgot, like our day was just so weird yesterday yeah. and we had lots going on. And then we, it was, I was in the shower at like midnight and I thought, and you were already asleep. And I thought, oh my goodness, I totally forgot to watch the video. Yeah. And so I usually watch it once and then Aaron passes through it again. Cause sometimes I'll make markers like, Hey, the audio needs to be fixed here or whatever. And so, but that footage needed to be added in mm -hmm. and I would really screw up a video if I tried to do that myself. So anyway, Aaron had to do that. I woke you up. I was yeah. like, Hey, <laughs> we forgot about the video. Do you want to mess with it? And you were like, no, just post that. It's I not was, be I was out of it. Yeah, you were. I had a procedure yesterday where I was, it's all fine, but, um, where I was put under. Uh -huh. And so like, I was just tired. Yeah, you were. And so I, yeah, I woke up and I had that, it was like a kind of a floaty feeling. Uh -huh. Like I wasn't, I was kind of almost like outside my body mm -hmm. and I was like, there's no way I'm gonna, like, well, I woke crack you up a laptop and then open. You acted like maybe you wanted to get up and, and do yeah. it because we're pretty like, I don't know. We like our schedule yeah. and our consistency and we don't like to get off of it if at all possible. Uh, so I thought you would probably get up and I went and like folded laundry and stuff. And then I kind of thought it's awful quiet in there. So yeah. I went back in. I'm like, Hey, <laughs> <laughs> so are you getting up or not? <laughs> so you were like, Nope, not doing it. So anyway, that's why we were late with today's video. Again, this is Friday. Blooming in Idaho said, what happens to the dirt and grass that is removed? I'm removing a large amount of grass this season and I don't know what to do with it. Put it out on Facebook. <laughs> 
Yeah. Most of the time, if you roll it up in nice rolls, people will come and get it. For, Don't get even it. do that. Just say free grass. Come get it. No, well, make them yeah, do the work. You could try that first, and if that doesn't work, then you might have to cut the sod and get it out. Then somebody will come and pick it up. Nine times out of ten, you can get rid of your grass that way. Or if you want them to do the work, you could even pay to rent the sod lifter. Or you could do the no-till method. Works super, super great. Yeah. Thick cardboard on top of that grass. So you make your line, you know, where you want the grass gone. Put the cardboard on top. I mean, pretty good, you know, good layer of sturdy cardboard. And then you put a generous amount of compost on the top of it. Wet it all down. Wet the cardboard down right first. Mm -hmm. And then put the compost in and wet the whole thing down. We did that in the back garden. I, I was just a little bit skeptical. I thought, well, grass Why are you is, skeptical of well, that? Well, I don't know. Just because I've only ever done it one way. You know, yeah. when you're used to doing something one way forever, that's just the way you do it. You know, let's just like do the back you're breaking so work. You're so adverse to new uh, ways of I doing know, something. Sometimes, I know. I know. It's my dad and me right there. Like, yeah. nope, we'll just, you know, yeah. carry on. I'm going to get that sod lifter. No, not even a sod lifter. I'll do it with a shovel. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need a tractor thing. with a rototiller. I've been plowing this field by hand yeah. all my life. <laughs> right. I know. With an oxen. I know. Um, anyway, yeah, the no-till method works amazing. So if you can do that, I would highly recommend that way. Uh, next video was easy window box plants for spring plus starting more annual flower seeds. Uh, that one was fun. I ended up, so I, I was down at the garden center. I didn't realize they had a, had a big load come in. And I thought I made a little reel and just kind of showed some of the things that were there. And I had one flat of violas that were so cute. And then I ended up with like 10 flats of violas and pansies because honestly when you get them in packs they're pretty inexpensive when you compare them to other plants that you could be putting in right now and when you're doing short-term planters which spring and fall planters typically are more short-term um, due to weather pansies and violas are the way to go so i just packed out six window boxes and two containers in front in front of as i say in front of but around our house and then i still had a flat and a half of violas left in the end uh, and they look so so pretty i did that last year and they lasted well into the summer because i didn't get to my window boxes until late it's usually one of the last things that i do uh, because they're shaded for most of the time even the ones on the south side they get more sun but they still are protected those pansies and violas last through quite a bit of heat um, so they just get big and beautiful and just full of color just love them and then i start <laughs> i don't know what i was thinking starting Oh, I thought I can do all these window boxes and start all of our four to six week before our, your average last frost annual flower seeds. I ended up having to do the some of them that day, but the rest of them the next day. Uh, Joanne said, do you cover your seeds with potting mix at all or do you use vermiculite on it no matter what the seed depth is supposed to be? I only cover them with the seed starting mix if it calls for it. If it calls for an eighth inch deep or a quarter inch deep or whatever, then they're underneath soil. I use vermiculite on top of most everything. I didn't use it on my sweet peas, but on top of most everything because it helps with algae growth. It helps with things, fungal things like damping off of your seedlings, which is fungal and it makes it look like your seedling comes up it's all healthy and beautiful and then all of a sudden it's just laying flat on top of the tray and you look at it and it looks like somebody came along and just pinched right at the base right above the soil pinched that seedling and made it fall over so the vermiculite helps with that it also helps with moisture retention which is super helpful in the beginning stages of seed starting I started using it based off a recommendation on Johnny's seed packet for like snapdragons I think one year and it was a game changer ever since that year I've used it. Brett said, wow, do, I do admire Laura's patience and kindness with Russell. Oh, in this video, Russell, God, he was all up in my business when I was trying to talk through the flower seeds. I was sitting in his chair that he normally yeah. lays in. I think that's why. Just a question. What is the name of these paper planters? I love the idea. I wonder if they would work out well in my area, which is very humid and anything degradable with what soil it usually gets moldy in a couple of days. Um, let me see what they're called. I think it's just... Let's see, they're on Gardener's Supply. Yeah, so you can get the pieces separately, like the tray, you can get the clips, the white clips that clip the um, paper pots to the sides, but you only need to use that while you're filling in with soil and then the clips can come off. So you really only need one set of the clips um, and then multiple trays, and then you get the paper pots come in just like they fold out accordion or pull out accordion style, um, but it's 50 cells, which is a really nice, that's a nice amount in one tray. They're not a standard size tray. I want to say, let's see, usually trays are 11 by 22. This one's 12 by 24. Uh, but the cells, being that there's 50 uh, instead of like 72, which is typical in 11 by 22 with six packs, 
uh, the cells are a little bit bigger. So the stuff that you plant in there will last a little bit longer. In your area where it's very humid and there's a lot of moisture, I wouldn't probably start anything that needed to stay in those pots for a huge amount of time. In fact, I saved some of mine back because I'm gonna be starting Cosmos and Zinnias in those instead of direct seeding this year. And it's gonna be nice because I can just pull them apart and pop them in the ground instead of popping them out of packs. Um, anyway, I tried them first, first time last year and just had really great luck with them. I grew amaranth, I grew a late crop of zinnias and then some celosia in them and they were just beautiful. Uh, Tony said, do you avoid buying seeds from big box stores such as Walmart or Home Depot? I don't avoid it. I just never look at them there, ever. And that's probably my local garden center background coming out right there. Um, when I go into the stores, I can't resist picking up many, many packages every time. Is it better to buy seeds from seed catalogs? I don't think it's necessarily better or wrong or anything like that. I think from seed catalogs, you might have more variety. Um, if there's, you know, varieties you want to try that you don't see in your stores. And it's like that for me too with my parents' garden center. I get everything I can from there. All the varieties that I want to grow, like ambrosia corn. Um, that's like, and my bean seeds. A lot of my bulk flower seeds like the Sensation Cosmos, Cracker Jack marigolds, tons of sunflowers. They've got a lot of bulk seeds. Uh, I usually get what I can from there and then all the specialty stuff I get online, typically from Johnny's because Johnny's has invaluable information on their seed packets. It's the best source of information I've come across. Uh, and we'd have never worked with Johnny's before. I know I show their seeds all the time, but we never have. I just buy them like everybody else. Uh, I just find that they are really helpful in the information department and I think their pricing is really good and you can get more so if you're growing a larger scale you can get more for a, a pretty good price the packets at the box stores are pretty I, I can't say because I never really look at them but they seem like they wouldn't have a ton of seeds in mm. them uh, Mary said I have a tray of gonfrina that germinated way faster than I expected and the seedlings stretched because I didn't have them under lights yet uh, you know what uh, I just filmed a video yesterday about that so by the time you see this one you will not have seen that one yet. <laughs> That'll probably be out on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, can I plant them deeper and bury the stems like you did with that variety toward the end of this video? Is that something a person can do with most seedlings? You know, you can do that with a lot of seedlings. It's not necessary with most like flowers and herbs unless they're super duper stretched. Um, and there's some that they don't recommend doing at all that I've never experimented with, so I can't really speak to, like melons and cucumbers, um, pumpkins, those kinds of things tend to rot a little bit easier. So if your seedling stretches, I don't think maybe skip bearing that one. Uh, and you do want to make sure your seedlings are up and like uh, strong enough to handle it. So you want to make sure that the plants have at least, you know, a true set of leaves going on on them before you before you bury them but I did recently bury all of our lettuce seedlings um, deeper well not all of them the icebergs they stretched more than the butterhead which is weird they were in the same exact location side by side must be a variety thing but they've taken to it beautifully you can do it on a lot of uh, vegetables stuff you know tomatoes especially um, broccoli and cauliflower and then I did the honeywort uh, in this video just because they were so tall. But I had a friend just text me um, last night saying that maybe that's how the honeywort grows because mine's doing the same thing and she's got the same exact sy system that I've got. Um, and I can't remember because it's been a couple years since I've grown honeywort. Maybe that's what happened last time, but they all look good. It hasn't adversely affected them at all to be buried deeper. Uh, Griffin said, do you pinch your stock seedlings like you would sweet peas? No, you don't need to pinch stock, just let it grow. Bert said, I love watching the Russell channel every morning. Do you train him to do all that? No. Russell, he is just a piece of work. Train him to be annoying. Oh, he could open doors. Like, because yeah. a lot of our doors have, I, I like the kind of doors that have the handle that do this because I can use my, like my hip or my foot to open the doors when I have my arms full of stuff. And he can jump up and open those door handles. And if he wants something and he's outside, he'll jump like mm -hmm. this high. Off the ground sometimes he gets crazy and he'll yeah. come to the kitchen door and he'll like do like a sidekick off the the oh, window yeah and then like run away but then you'll like let him in and he doesn't know what to do with himself yeah, anymore right. he spends so much more of his time outside and he's got the warm greenhouse that's where he sleeps most of his time i find him in there um but yeah he'll come in and he just kind of like wanders like yeah. i don't really know how to handle this anymore um, but the other day I was walking up to the back door and he was on like right in front of it and he was taking swipes at me. Like, <laughs> are you turning? Do you have rabies? Yeah, right. <laughs> What's going on here? 
Yeah, he's just a weirdo cat. And then you'll see him out in the garden somewhere, like at a distance. And you, you know, they get that wild hair. Mm-hmm. He'll run and he'll get that twitch and he'll jump like five feet in the air and then take off running the other direction. It's kind of funny to watch him. And you guys, that is it for today's video. I don't think there's anything else. Oh, uh, we could probably, we could address how we haven't been posting our videos like natively in Facebook for the last week or so. Um, It's just too much of a headache. Like Facebook is just meta. They're just really hard to work with as a creator. Mm. And, um, and you know, they're rolling out this uh, verified program. You know how we haven't been verified for years. Mm -hmm. It kind of, it blows me away a little bit because you know, we have like 3.8 million followers on Facebook. And I would think that, you know, when someone crosses a threshold for YouTube, it's when you cross cross 100,000 followers, mm-hmm. they automatically just reach out to you and say, hey, let's verify your account mm-hmm. because you've crossed this threshold. Because that's a big milestone. Yeah. So I would think that maybe at like a million that they would reach out to us and say, hey, we see that, you know, you've been uploading consistently for eight years on right. our platform. You must be real. Yeah, you must be a real person. Let's go <laughs> ahead and verify your account. And, um, you know, YouTube will, like, they'll give you access to people that you can contact if there's an issue. Mm-hmm. Facebook does none of that. And um, they copyright every single one of our videos. We get a copyright strike where we get a notification saying, you know, you're using someone else's music. And mm-hmm. I've contacted the people that we talked about this last time, but mm-hmm. I contact the people we're buying the license from and they're like, yeah, you know, you can try to dispute it, but there's nothing that, you know, we can do on our end. And so it just doesn't feel like it's worth it to, to play ball anymore. Yeah. So for, for now, we'll probably only post videos on Facebook that don't include music. Mm-hmm. I don't really want to change how we're editing, you know, videos. Yeah. Right. Um, we'll just, we'll basically make YouTube videos and then, you know, watch on YouTube. We'll post a link to mm-hmm. it on Facebook so you can still watch it, but otherwise. Do you have um, to have a, an account or something like that? Cause I've seen comments like I don't have a, no, you don't have to subscribe. Right. You don't have to pay. It's free. Um, I mean like most everybody has a Gmail account. So like you don't have to have a Gmail account. You can't comment unless you have a Google account. So anybody can watch it. Yeah no matter what right i mean not having a google account is crazy because like they have their google has their fingers kind of everywhere like are you telling me that you don't use gmail or youtube or some people don't yeah i guess or have an android phone um like you have to create one if you have an android phone Mm -hmm. android phones are everywhere i mean we use iphones but Mm -hmm. you know so anyway um just watch on YouTube. We mess for now. around with stuff too, you know, sometimes just seeing like, you know, it'd be, is it even beneficial for us to be posting on Facebook anymore? You know, what would happen if we only posted on YouTube? Yeah. Would that There's be just that? increasingly yeah. less and less. That's the other thing is that the algorithm just does not favor our style of content at this yeah, point. Yeah. They did it one time when we were creating like really sh- uh, sped up videos. We just don't do that anymore. No, we don't. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. It definitely doesn't prefer like long form content. No. Um, Oh, the other thing that I was going to bring up, they, they are coming out with their verification program, which I'm super not in favor of. Um, they want to charge people, it's like maybe $15 a month. I, I'm not sure about the price. It could be $10, could be $20. We'll just say $15 mm-hmm. um, to verify your account. So they used to do it for free. And mm-hmm. I understand why they were slow to verify people because they probably knew that they wanted to roll out a program where you had to pay to Mm -hmm. verify your account. And I think that's a really slippery slope for social media because they'll start with creators where you're paying $15 and then they'll start rolling it out to the masses Mm -hmm. where maybe it's not $15, but maybe, you know, you need to verify your account for $5 a month. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, you're paying five bucks a month for, to use Facebook when it used to be free Yeah, and you'll still have the ads. It won't be like an ad free experience or anything. And then there will be no reason to be verified because anybody, yeah, because anybody can be verified Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like giving everybody a trophy. So I really don't like that idea. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we will pay for verification unless it comes with some other perk. You know, right now the perks that it has, is just the blue check Mark. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't, I don't want to pay money for, for doing that. I think that's a really, I think everybody should be against that because it'll lead to everyone eventually paying for social media. Right. And I don't think anybody really wants that. Yeah. 
especially if you still have to watch the ads. Yeah, it's like, like YouTube offers their ad free experience, like $10 a month or whatever it is for mm -hmm. uh, YouTube premium. And I actually think that's fine because having two different models where, you know, what was it last week or the week before where I said like sponsors, you know, keep everything running. Yeah. You pretty much have to have one of two models. One, you pay for all the content you consume mm -hmm. or two, the ads pay for the content right. you consume. And when you pay, it's more expensive when you pay for the content you consume. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at it. Now, if you buy Hulu, if you have like Hulu and Netflix mm -hmm. and you have YouTube and you know, HBO and all the other ones, Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, it's expensive when you start adding all those things up. Mm -hmm. So I think an ad experience is a better way to go personally, mm -hmm. but it's fine to have both. Sure. All that said, I think we're done for today. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. That's Aaron's thoughts on the whole verified Thoughts with Aaron. Thing. We should have a segment. Yes. Thoughts. We should. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> People would love it. Uh, anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Hope you have a great week and we will see you in the next one. Bye.